I'd like to introduce our panelists, if I could. Um, first here is Dr. Nathaniel Chin. He is the Director of Medical Services, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, right here in Madison, as well as Geriatric Memory and Dementia Physician at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics. And Dr. Chin's father recently did pass away from Alzheimer's disease as well. Uh, next, we have Linda Norton, right there in the middle. She's an adult nurse practitioner with a Grace Palliative Care. She has a background in oncology and neuropsychiatry, uh, with an emphasis in ger <coughs> geriatrics. And on the end is Dr. Patricia Newman, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, hospice and palliative care, and is a hospice medical director. So it's our pleasure to have these uh, professionals with us today. We hope to have a little bit of time at the end of the program to uh, take a few questions from the audience if we could, but we'll start with uh, some questions here to kind of get the ball rolling for our panel. So thank you again, panelists. Uh, if each of you could share with, with us kind of what drew, drew you to work in, in, this, uh, in this area and with this population, we'd be appreciative. Start. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so I did my medical school education here at Madison and then went off to San Diego to do my training in internal medicine. And I actually thought I was going to be an infectious disease physician. Um, and it was during that training that one, I realized that it was not the career for me. And then two, when my father got diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and was diagnosed here at UW uh, by Dr. Mark Sager. And so that changed a lot for me, both personally and professionally. And it was during that time that I realized that I wanted uh, to be a part of the movement against Alzheimer's disease to address Alzheimer's disease. And so my wife and I moved back uh, from San Diego to be here to be with my father and my mother, who is his primary caregiver. Uh, and I had known uh, Dr. Sanjay Astana, who's the head of our program as a medical student. So I became, I went to the geriatric fellowship I loved geriatrics, have always enjoyed working with the older population during my term of medicine, so it's been nicely. And then through my fellowship, I was really able to focus my career on memory care, on dementia, on uh, what's now my, my passion, lifestyle, interventions, for just healthy aging. Thank you. Linda? Um, so I don't know if you can hear me with this. Um, you talked us a little oh, right. to it. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. yes. All right. Um, I'm, as a nurse practitioner, I um, was in Southern California, um, spent years um, at UCLA doing oncology and oncology research. And through that experience, um, became more and more familiar with the aging population and what, what's been going on around Alzheimer's neurocognitive um, issues and um, and then my mother um, developed Alzheimer's and so was a direct caregiver with, with her and um, that just knowing the challenges and the intensities of, of that experience um, really deepened my understanding and through my practice of I've been involved now for 40 years can't believe it but um, just learning and and learning from the families that I've worked with and um, just deepening the my awareness of the intensity of what people go through. It's, um, you know, with palliative care, there is the diagnosis. And it's, what do I do? How do I live with this? What do what does my family do? How, um, how do we plan for future care? So that was a lot of the, the lived experience part is where I really feel drawn to, committed to, um, continuously getting educated with whatever's new, different, whatever's helpful, um, and then helping people learn about their own personal research resources and getting them plugged in places. So that's just been the draw. And then my, of recent, my father was diagnosed, so now I'm a, um, a distant caregiver, and just some of the challenges of not being there directly, day to day. Um, so that's my that's my why I'm so drawn. Okay, thank you, Linda. Patty, how about you? 
Well, um, I wasn't actually uh, drawn into end-of-life care through dementia. Many years ago, when I was 23, my mom died from cancer without the help of hospice care. Um, I was away at college at the time, and my father thought that I shouldn't know she was terminal. So I actually didn't uh, know she was going to die until uh, she had already slipped into a coma two days before she died. Uh, shortly after that, well, several months actually, um, I saw an ad in the newspaper to uh, become a hospice volunteer. So I went to the training, and that's where my uh, grieving for her death actually started. And I found, um, I became a respite volunteer, which means go into people's homes and sit uh, with the dying patient while the caregiver goes out of the home. Um, I found it really um, comforting and amazing to be surrounded by people who were willing to uh, talk about death, accept that death was happening, and I could see how valuable it was, not only for the dying person, but for all the people left behind, to have a, what we would call, what we call in hospice as a good death. Uh, so I really um, started out my medical career in pain and spine care, and I did interventional pain as well as musculoskeletal medicine in Green Bay. Uh, then I, uh, somebody up there heard about my previous volunteer work and uh, asked if I would be interested in changing my career again, which I said, uh, yeah, I, I would. Um, so that's how I ended up in hospice and palliative care. And I just recently joined a grace about um, two months ago. Um, and very happy to be here in Madison. Thank you, Pat. Um, Nate, let's start with you. Um, it seems that research and treatment is increasingly focused on early intervention. How much memory loss is normal in the aging process, and when should someone be concerned? It's an excellent question. And so first, mem memory changes, thinking changes, do happen as we get older. There is this normal process of aging. And it is hard to differentiate normal aging from something pathological where there's actually a process. But we, we need to think about it as if the changes we're experiencing are persistent, if they're happening every day, and if they, we feel they're actually interfering with our ability to just get through the day, the day, to do well in the day, then that's something that should be concerning enough that you'd want to present to your primary care provider and ask questions. And so just some examples, though, of what we would consider normal aging. Word finding, which is one of the most common complaints when you come into my memory clinic, can happen in normal aging. Oftentimes we feel people say, in, the, in cases of normal aging, they'll struggle with the word. And maybe the conversation is over and then the word comes. Or maybe it takes five minutes. And the idea that the word eventually comes is more suggestive that this is normal aging. It may not be. But in general, we find that people who can actually get the word do have normal aging. We know that people are more distracted when they get older. It takes uh, more energy to focus. And so that can be something that people often worry about, but in truth, that's just one of the consequences of getting older. Um, it takes more for us to recall random facts or figures. And so this is something that's very concerning to people, that in the middle of a conversation, they'll try to remember the name of something or, or a fact. And it'll be hard to pull that information without having a cue. But we do know that, to some degree, this is expected as we get older. So while I don't have a very good answer as far as, well, how do I know when I need to present? I would say that if it happens often and you feel just worried about it, there is no harm in going in and, and asking your primary for what I would call a cognitive screener, where they would do a 10-minute test, uh, objective test, just to see if maybe there's a signal there. From there, there are other steps that would happen and eventually a person would get referred to me. But I would, I would say don't just sit on it. If you're worried, talk about it. You either talk to a, a close friend or family member and see if they've observed something or go to your primary care provider. Okay, thank you. So basically the formal diagnosis, would be, I mean, how, what does it take to get a formal diagnosis then? And what would, what would be the benefit of having that? So I think, first of all, I think having a formal diagnosis is imperative. We need to know what's going on before we can really make true interventions specifically to you. 
Uh, so I do think people need to be coming in as soon as possible. We are, we are showing through research that the earlier we do interventions, the better odds we have in making a meaningful impact. And I'm not necessarily saying a cure, but this idea of true disease modification, truly modifying the course of someone's condition, the earlier we address it, the, the better our odds in having a more um, slow change. And so the, the process itself can be quite long. For, for people who have been into my clinic, they would know you're there for two to three hours. And that is because a person goes through one hour of pretty rigorous brain testing. And there are many different parts of the brain, it's not just memory. There's up to 30 different domains or, or regions of the brain that one could test for. We happen to test for the most common 10, and then that happens over an hour period. A person has to bring in a friend, a family member, a loved one who knows them well, because during the testing, we are talking to that person to get their perspective. What changes have they seen? What things have concerned them? What is the life experience of a person? Because we're more than just a brain with memories. There are things that have happened to us that are important for us to know about. After that, you'd meet with me and I would do a, a neurological exam. And then we would talk about the testing results and what things we need to do next. And that whole process takes quite a while, so a lot of my, my patients are tired at the end of it. Uh, but I think it's important to have someone come in and get a diagnosis the same day. And that's a different model. That's not what they do uh, in other parts of the country. It's something that we in Wisconsin with the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute have come up with because we feel it's important to get that information out as soon as possible. There are subsequent visits where we talk about other things to do, other interventions, but that diagnosis is critical before we can begin with those, those next steps. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what services can my regular doctor or anyone's regular doctor provide, and when does it make sense to see a specialist or a gerontologist instead of a family doctor? And if that's the case, what about integrative medicine or functional medicine? Can you speak to that? So I think there's a lot that the primary care and provider can do. And to start with, it's looking at treatable, modifiable, reversible causes of a person's memory or thinking changes. And so that really means looking at a person's medication list. Oftentimes we see that it's what we're taking that can be affecting our memory and our thinking. And so to do a proper and true medication reconciliation, which really is sitting down with people and going over everything they're taking, not just prescribed medications, but supplements, to know if those potentially could be affecting us. And a good example is that people often take Benadryl or Tylenol PM, Advil PM to help them sleep. And that is a great offender to someone's thinking. That Benadryl part of it removes the signal in the brain that we're trying to promote when we think about uh, remembering information. So that's one piece, medications. The next is going over med medical problems. How is your blood pressure? How is your sleep apnea? How is your hypothyroidism? Going over all those medical problems and making sure that we're addressing them. But then I think the, the next really important piece is addressing mood. One of the greatest mimickers of dementia is depression. And oftentimes, especially Wisconsin people, we're very stoic and we don't talk about our mood. But when people are going through sadness, anxiety, those things can affect our thinking. And so the primary care provider can address those. Uh, if something comes up, they can order blood tests, looking at thyroid function, looking at vitamin levels. And they can also get a brain scan to just look at the structure of the brain. Now, if any of those things are concerning or that cognitive screener is concerning, at that point, I would ask that primary care provider to refer to any of the memory centers across the state of Wisconsin, whether it's neurology, geriatrics, geriatric psychiatry. You can get in, it might take a bit, it may take up to a couple months, a few months, but after that, you'll go through that three hour process and you'll leave the clinic with the diagnosis and the plan. Thank you. We all know about depression, especially with the way the factors have been playing lately. So, Linda, uh, when might palliative care come into play and does that replace my doctor's care? Well, that is a really great question as well. And with palliative care, oftentimes, um, you know, the timing can be important. Um, palliative care in, is essentially upstream from hospice. 
Um, a lot of times people hear the word palliative care, they immediately think, oh, you know, my loved one is going to die. And when we think about, you know, upstream where the person is going through many, may have many symptoms, um, a dementing process may be just one of them. They may have cardiovascular, um, other neurologic um, issues going on. So it's really a compilation of a lot of different things going on with the person and the family and the people that touch that patient or that person. Um, and so palliative care is really addressing symptoms and what is helping that person to be more comfortable in their and quality, promoting the quality of their life. Well, that all sounds great, but how do we do that? And um, with uh, Pali Health is where um, the palliative practice that I have is um, a home-based practice. And we know that people go into the clinic, they spend maybe 10, 15 minutes in there making some med adjustments, talking about, hi, how are you stuff, but then they go home and they didn't tell their doctor about how they fell last night or they can't swallow their pills or, you know, there's all these other little details because um, in Wisconsin people are very stoic and they don't want to show that part. Um, they don't want to disappoint or there's a million reasons why people don't share those kind of details. So we have found um, in, we're, we're probably one of the few across the country that have a home-based practice. We go into the homes and like in the clinic, um, getting formal testing, we'll spend two hours. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. It all depends on what the needs are. And we're looking at palliative care, symptom management, finding out the things that are distressing in the home, helping the family talk about it. And most of the times, just the whole mere fact that someone has listened to what they've been through can, can start a whole healing process just right there. And then from there, building on that, doing a deeper dive, looking at you know the things that people talk about that are, are the things that make their day work and um, what, what helps to support mood and how are they eating and how do they get from that that recliner chair into the bathroom, you know, I mean, just like a million different things. So, um, you know, looking at the day-to-day -day symptoms and also the personal health philosophy of the family, you know, we all have it. We all say, I'm the person that doesn't want anything done. And then you've got, I'm the person that wants everything done. And then there's a million different permutations in between. And it's kind of teasing those out through conversation um, where, you know, I can provide education, I can provide results taken from clinic and research and then help people understand what they're dealing with. And, um, you know, so it's education, it's educating, it's listening, it's patience, it's just dis mainly discovery. And, um, but the whole focus is all about the person. And, People um, come referred through a million different directions. They come self-refer, family members will refer. Um, oftentimes they'll come in from the clinic because they just need extra eyes in the home and somebody to sit down and figure out, does this, does this family need more supports in the home? What, you know, what are they having to go through every day? Um, so that sometimes facilities where people live, their home is wherever they live, and the facility um, staff may be very concerned and worried, and maybe they feel like they need some help with understanding what the, what the patient or individual's needs are. So, um, you know, home and caregivers and providers, and all of us are really um, there to support, to support the family. And, um, advanced directives, um, um, you know, choosing an agent to help speak for them when they're not able to. Um, how much care would they want? Where would they want that care? How intense do they want that care? Um, again, you know, those two ends of the spectrum, the, the bell curve, 
is um, you know helping a person be okay with their decisions, and that's a really hard one. Is that giving people non-judgmental support and just listening to what their personal goals are. So defining those goals can be extremely hard, you know, and um, so that's where I, I feel um, very drawn and committed to being able to help people tease out those personal philosophies and what they would like, either at the end of their life, leading up to the end of their life, and soon after diagnosis, just trying to look at the whole trajectory and where they most need the help. And like what Dr. Chen said, it's a process. It's never a one and done conversation because things change over time and people need support along the way, kind of keeping pace with where the patient and the family are in their, you know, in their life. So um, that's just a little bit about what palliative care is about. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, that was great. So Patty, uh, what role does hospice care play in the mix? How does that coordinate with other doctors? Okay, so um, hospice care in the United States is a Medicare paid benefit, and most private insurance companies also will cover hospice care. Um, because it is paid for by the government, there are regulations around it. And one of those regulations is that a hospice employed physician has to determine if a patient's uh, diagnosis um, likely gives them a prognosis of six months or less to live. Um, obviously, dementia is a terminal diagnosis, but it can be a long, uh, prolonged uh, diagnosis. And so not everyone who gets uh, diagnosed with dementia can immediately come on to a hospice program. What I, think, what I find a lot of people want to know is when do I call hospice um, or who does that for me? So you should know that anybody can refer a patient to hospice uh, care. That's different than regular medical care, right? You're not gonna uh, call a cardiothoracic surgeon and say, um, I'd like an appointment with you because I need open heart surgery. Your doctor has to do that for you. Um, in hospice, anybody can make a referral. You can self-refer, you can refer your loved one. What happens after the referral comes into the hospice that you call or choose is the hospice will then gather medical information about the patient and then send somebody from hospice to the home, usually a registered nurse, who is also uh, aware of some of the regula regulations around what qualifies you to receive hospice care. Um, that person then calls the hospice um, employed physician. They go over the records together and determine, yes, this person at this point in time likely has six months or less to live. These regulations are um, uh, pretty, um, intertwined and complicated um, regarding a lot of pathophysiology knowledge and just knowledge of trajectory of disease course. And also in hospice, you have usually more than one diagnosis that points to a prognosis of six months or less to live. So sometimes a person might not be uh, completely end stage with dementia, but they also have pretty bad heart disease and or lung disease or a new diagnosis of cancer. Um, so those are the things that uh, a hospice doctor takes into account, understanding the pathophysiology of all these things, looking at the patient's medical records, to determine if the person likely has six months or less to live. So if you're wondering if hospice is the thing, if, if your loved one or you are ready for hospice, um, you can actually call any hospice and they will have a look at that person for you and to help you determine if that if it's time yet or not. And I will also um, say, you know, as our population is aging, and I think we're all pretty aware that our society doesn't offer a whole lot of support for uh, caregivers. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes we do get um, referrals for pe people with dementia, and it's actually too soon for hospice. Um, but that's usually explained to the person. And we always uh, encourage people to continue you know, to call us back, or we will keep track then after that and, and contact the family as well. Thank you. Um, perhaps uh, Patty and Nate could speak to the uh, role that medication plays in treatment. Uh, specifically, are there any medications that should be avoided or that have, may have been linked to increasing risk? So 
So I mentioned as far as medications to avoid Benadryl or anything that, Benadryl is in a, a class of drugs called anticholinergic. And so there are a lot of drugs that even have some of those properties. And the significance of that is that choline is the signal in the brain that helps our cells communicate to remember things. So anything that is anticholine or anticholinergic is something that can have a negative effect on our thinking. And so there are even antidepressants that have some anticholinergic properties. And the one, for instance, um, Paxil. So Paxil or Paroxetine, which it has its purpose, but unfortunately it has some of that uh, anticholinergic property. So when we can avoid it, if there are reasonable alternatives, then we would choose the reasonable alternative. So Benadryl, um, anything that's anticholinergic. I will also say that while the evidence is not there yet, we do have concerns about medications such as benzodiazepines. So that's Valium, Ativan, Xanax. These medications also have a purpose. However, if we use them over 30 years or even 20 years, we know that there can be detrimental effects. So even if it wasn't for the cognition, we know that um, risks of falling go up when a person's on these medications. Strong pain medications are also ones that we worry about. Uh, so narcotics, opioid medications, um, things like Vicodin, things uh, like Percocet, Oxycodone, Morphine. Again, having their purpose in the right setting, but over a long period of time may be increasing our risks um, because of the, the movement to avoid opioids. More and more people are on something called gabapentin. In gabapentin, we do not have evidence that it increases one's risk of developing dementia, but that's because it's a new medication and it's going to take time for us to study this. My mentality, and I think the mentality of, of most geriatricians, palliative care providers, is that if we don't need a medication, we shouldn't be on a medication. Um, and so we have to be careful about that. I will say that as far as medications specifically for dementia, there are two, in particular there's a class, uh, called acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So this is the one where if you see on TV, this is denepazil, this is rivastigmine or galantamine. These are medications to treat symptoms. It promotes that signal, the choline signal. Uh, and then the other one is called lamantine or nemenda. And again, this is a symptomatic treatment for someone who already has dementia. But we, we do uh, have some studies that show there are benefits up to a year and potentially the benefits extend beyond that in that if you were not on this medication, we might be seeing more of a decline. And so really the goal of these medications are to keep stability and reduce decline, but they don't address the underlying disease and so we're not seeing true disease modification or cure with them. That's the reason why these clinical trials that are currently out, they're looking for getting at that underlying process. Thank you. Patty, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I would just say that, unfortunately, uh, sometimes when uh, somebody's very end-stage dementia, uh, they will have behaviors, um, like extreme anxiety, um, sometimes aggression as well, and we do sometimes use benzodiazepines. We don't use Benadryl um, to control these symptoms. And it, uh, the patient cannot tell us, of course, what's going on with them. So it is often a trial and error. You start with a low dose of the medication and see if it helps. Now this is when patients are very end stage uh, in their dementia process and they can't tell us what's going on. Um, I will say though, we do know in the hospice world, people with dementia are, are uh, under treated for pain. We also know from research that they still feel as much pain as a normal person does. So there is some assumption that dementia, because you can't communicate, you're not having those pain. You are having the pain. And so when I am uh, supporting field staff calling me um, what to do with somebody who has a new onset of agitation, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to get as clear and detail the history as I can of what went on with this person for the last week or so. Uh, there are sometimes things that occur, a fall, um, maybe moved around in the bed or in the bathtub by a well-meaning um, caregiver who might have done something to a very arthritic joint. 
pulled a ligament or a tendon and literally didn't even know that they did that. So I'm always gonna treat pain first. I'm gonna assume that a behavior change on a massive scale is a pain problem first. Um, I'll start with uh, scheduled Tylenol. Stay away, I, I stay away from the NSAIDs because of the side effects of those medications. Um, if Tylenol isn't enough, though, I will often start, go with a low dose of an opioid, usually a low dose of oxycodone, and see if we get a response from that. It is not my intention with these medications to knock somebody out, um, but it certainly is to see if the problem with the behavior was a pain problem. Thank you. Um, Linda, cognitive impairment is uh, sometimes mistaken for depression and persons living with dementia as well as caregivers being susceptible to depression and anxiety. What kind of mental health supports do you recommend for families affected by dementia? Well, well there is a, a broad, broad range um, there. And again, you know, in palliative care, we look at the whole system, the whole family, and um, it, it could be something as simple as, which is not simple, but, um, you know, pain management. The person is, you know, in pain, it's affecting their mood, they're not sleeping well at night. All of that starts oftentimes a, a spiral of symptoms and it's almost like a syndrome. So you do have to, again, taking time and teasing away um, the different pieces of it and then targeting either behavior, um, in-home um, changes, again, that's where the intimacy of being in the home and, and seeing what a day is like, you can start to see patterns. So um, as, um, as we heard about medication, um, oftentimes that's usually the go-to, you know, let's just manage that with a pill or some sort of um, chemical. However, there are other ways to address it, and we call those non-pharmacologic measures and strategies, and it's looking at, um, you know, sometimes laying a person down in the later afternoon for 30 minutes, not four hours, but for 30 minutes can help sort of reboot things a little bit and get them through a tough time where there's behaviors um, kindling up in the latter part of the, um, the day. And, you know, it's looking at those types of simple things that um, can really help smooth out um, some of the, the bumps in the road. As far as the depression goes, when it does need to be, when you've teased out everything that you can, and you're just seeing that really, truly there is, um, the depression is something that needs to be worked on, um, you know, looking at some of the medications that are, are available that are, you know, going to interfere or worsen memory or worsen some of the other behaviors that um, can start to crop up as a person moves along that trajectory. Um, the other piece that I think is, you know, oftentimes completely goes under the radar is what caregivers are experiencing. And, um, and we look at um, just the, the interaction between family members um, can go so far in just helping the mood and the tenor of the family environment and um, making sure that the caregivers, um, no matter who they are, but those people, just in terms of their relationship and how to help improve that um, relationship and make sure that the, the caregivers are getting time away, they're getting their sleep, they're getting their nourishment, that their health needs are being addressed, and emotionally, spiritually, and um, you know there, you know there are spiritual grief counselors out there that can help them process through the loss of the relationship that they have with their loved one, um, as well as support systems. I know Grace now has a spiritual um, counseling. Uh, support group that's held every week for, for caregivers and um, it's you know just being able to get out of the home have time away to refresh their own life as a, as a person um, can go so far in just improving the, the um, tenor again of the family at home so that's just a tiny little snippet but it 
it's you know, and mental health, of course, you know, referrals to mental health practitioners and providers. And um, we have a social worker in Pali Health who does a great deal of work in that area. So, of course, we definitely tap into her. So, um, anyway. Thank you. Open this up to all three of you. <clears throat> Are there any things that we can do in our in our daily life that would uh, decrease our chances of developing dementia or possibly slow the progression of the disease? So I would say that the two things that are most researched and have the most evidence for are physical activity and the food that we eat. So when it comes to physical activity, our center uh, is one of the leaders in looking at uh, how much of a, how many minutes per week does one need to be active. And when I say active, I mean increasing your heart rate. And we use the expression of moderate aerobic activity, and that is um, measured through what's called the talk test. So when you're doing your activity, if you're able to talk and sing to the person next to you, and not that you would have to do this, but if you were capable of doing those two things, that's considered light activity. Now frankly, I'm still appreciative if that's, the, if that's as aggressive as you can get, that's still wonderful. And some activity is better than no activity. However, if you are able to talk to the person next to you, but not sing to them, well, that's considered moderate activity, and that's exactly what we're looking for. If you can't talk or sing, that's considered vigorous, and we don't need that level of activity in order to provide that increase in blood flow, that increase in oxygen and nutrients to the brain. So what we find is that people who are able to achieve moderate aerobic activity for up to 150 minutes a week, which is roughly 30 minutes a day, five days a week, but it can be broken into any increment that you want, although ideally it would be 10 minutes or more, but it really is up to the individual. But people who are able to do that, we are seeing larger brains, we are seeing healthier cells using metabolizing sugar, and we're seeing an association, so not a cause, but an association with less of the protein called amyloid, which we believe is the beginning process of Alzheimer's disease. Moreover, one of our researchers has shown that people who already have amyloid in the brain, and they don't have any diagnoses, they don't have any symptoms, but they have the presence of that protein, they performed better on testing when they were already pretty physically active. So again, suggesting that physical activity may be able to negate or mute some of the negative consequences of this abnormal protein. So there's a lot of research going into it. There's a lot of other benefits. It does help with mood, it helps with function. Um, so physical activity is definitely something that, that in my clinic I'm always promoting and I think it's really important. And the benefit too is that it's relative to your own body. So you do not have to be running marathons, you do not have to be sprinting. To, to achieve what we're looking for. It is relative to what your body is capable of doing and needing. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is diet. And so we do a lot of research into the foods that are the healthiest for our heart and our brain. And the diet that seems to be the most successful is called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. It's Mediterranean and low salt. It was created by Dr. Martha Claire Morris at Russia University just over in Chicago. And she has shown that people who follow her diet the most versus people who didn't follow it, their brains were seven and a half years younger. And so she is showing evidence of this anti-inflammatory, antioxidant type of food and how it, over the long term it can have a benefit to our aging brains. Her diet's also much more um, flexible and lax compared to the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet is very well studied and it's a wonderful diet, but it's not easy to follow. And the MIND diet has a little bit more um, free, free room to enjoy things like cheese, a little bit of fried food, a little bit of red meat. And so when I met Martha Clemmers, I told her this diet isn't going to work in Wisconsin because we love fried cheese curds. You might as well not come. She said, no, it's okay. We, we just have to reduce our portions and maybe have it a little less often. Okay, thank you. How do we evaluate and use non-traditional approaches like these? This is where, when I'm in the home, this is where 
you know, slowly the giant box comes out of the closet of every single pill, nutritional supplement that you can even imagine comes out. And sometimes we just have to pick through, sort it through to say, yeah, this one might cause this kind of problem and that kind of problem. And, um, because we're, you know, we're, we want to try to fix things, you know, and we hear things and they're, you know, we want to see if this is going to help our loved one. We're very motivated. Um, I think as adults, we are very motiva motivated to uh, be independent as possible. So anyway, you know, getting people to sort of like, it's like the, you know, <laughs> sort of the struggle between letting some of that go and, um, and, and looking at moderation as well, looking at things that aren't specifically going to harm the person. Um, so, yeah, so it's out there and it will always be out there, but, um, you know, just trying to work and not be judgmental about it and just knowing that it comes from a good place of, of wanting to heal and help and out of caring, but, you know, it's, it's, Trying to moderate that a little bit is, I think, that's where I, I like to go. I think. Uh, if I could comment too, but I have a lot of research participants, um, the sunbirds or the snowbirds, who will go to states that where they do they have legalized marijuana, or they or they're using CBD, and so we don't have evidence one way or the other when it comes to marijuana or CBD as far as cognition. There are some studies that show daily chronic use of marijuana does impair one of the functions in our brain called the executive function. So this is our ability to multitask, to process, uh, to do a sequence of, of events in the right order. So we do think that, I think that we all know that too much of anything is not a good is not good for us, and so daily chronic use of CBD or marijuana may have a negative impact. I do have plenty of people who say to me that they feel better, and I would argue that perhaps that's because we're addressing something else and underlying anxiety and underlying stress, and that these medications can help treat that. And maybe it's not specifically the memory, but it's something else, and because mood and stress. Uh, are so important to, to address. I think that uh, people might be uh, unintentionally addressing that. Coconut oil is a very interesting uh, thing, and I always get this when I'm out in the community. Uh, I've tried coconut oil. I put it in my coffee when I first read Mary Newport's book. Uh, so the, the downside is that it's very high in saturated fat. Saturated fat has been linked to a lot of cardiovascular disease, so there is, there's, there is a downside to this. I think more than anything, coconut oil is promoting this idea of ketogenesis, where we're having ketones in the body instead of glucose. So glucose is sugar. When we eat a very high carb diet, we have a lot of sugar. And too much sugar is a bad thing. Too much sugar leads to diabetes, which is one of the, the biggest risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease. And ketones, uh, there's a lot of physiological research, especially in mice, showing that ketones may be a very effective alternative for our brains, uh, but there's not a whole lot of data on that, and so we don't have a lot to stand on when we talk about uh, ketogenesis or ketogenic diets. I will tell you that the University of Kansas, their Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, is looking at the ketogenic diet as far as cognition, so it's not an implausible thing. Um, but it, when, when people talk about coconut oil, there are other ways of getting into ketogenesis without raising that risk of saturated fat. Thank you. The last thing we'll finish up here as we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, Timmy, I'm sorry? We could, we, yeah, I'll play Monty Hall right now. Phil Donahue, let's take a question. You seem like you've got one here, sure. Does anybody have a question? Okay, this is our last question. Let's see if Dale's has one. Do you have one? Just one. So uh, I have a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, which is not so common. It's very hard to find research that is dealing with that particular disease. I mean, I, I can't do any Alzheimer's research because I would screw up, confound the results, as my statistician husband would have said. Um, any ideas? It's also harder to find information about Lewy body than it is Alzheimer's. You're absolutely right. And in our, 
our Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers, as the name suggests, we do focus primarily on Alzheimer's. Now, there are certain centers that do uh, look at living body as well, and I can't come, come up with them off the top of my head. This is free recall. I'm not able to tell you which centers are looking at living body. Um, but they do exist. There are some that's just smaller. You're absolutely right. Um, the, the National Institute on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, the Alliance, their, their websites do provide some background information on moving body. You're right. It's not, it's not the best it's because we do focus so heavily on Alzheimer's. I will say to you, because I do have uh, patients who have mixed dementia, so Alzheimer's and moving body, that I do believe that the lifestyle things of diet, exercise, um, stress reduction, socializing, brain activity still apply to Louis body. I would even argue that um, being as functionally active applies more, knowing that there's more of a Parkinsonism to Louis body dementia, and that we really need to, this building resilience. We, when we are early in this disease, we need to be as aggressive as possible, knowing that with time there's going to be change and trying to buffer against that time. <clears throat> Thank you, great question. Uh, both, uh, or I should say Nate, Linda, and Patty will be around for a few minutes. Obviously, if you have some questions afterwards. Um, Stacy wanted me to let everybody know um, to make sure to sign up for any of the workshops that are coming up at the information desk. Uh, the ones that are at 2 o'clock, uh, the Financial Power of Attorney in room 207, and Healthcare uh, Power of Attorney and Living Wills in room 204.